This video features basically all of the lore discovered in the network test version of the game, and it's split into two parts. Part 1 talks about everything to do with the Erd Tree and the Golden Order, and part 2 begins here, and it talks about everything to do with the stars and glintstone sorcery. These used to be two videos, and I meant to release them like a month ago, so I'm sorry for that. Next week, we'll all be playing Elden Ring, but until then, I still think this video will serve as a good foundation for the lore that you're going to discover as you play. I can't wait to discover it all with you. But without further ado, let's begin. One of the very first pieces of lore that you're confronted with is the fact that you're maidenless and fully divorced from the strength of runes. Now runes are your currency. They're tiny fragments of the shattered Elden Ring, and to make use of them, most enlightened tarnished require the help of someone called a Finger Maiden. These maidens serve a faction called the Two Fingers. Incantations from this faction rely on faith, and are for the most part benevolent healing spells, things like heal, or urgent heal, or cure poison. They all read, the Maidens serve the Two Fingers by guiding the Tarnished to grace, in accordance with its mighty will. Now, remember, Tarnished were once spurned by the grace of gold and the greater will. They were rejected. And unsurprisingly, rejection is also a spell of the Two Fingers. And I feel like, as Tarnished, we're going to have to decide whether we really want to serve this greater will, even after it rejected us for so long. This greater will requires nothing less than total obedience, and the rejection miracle reads, Hark, tarnished. If you truly walk in faith, you must be prepared to reject all else. So, with all of this, you'd think then that Melina, our maiden, is a maiden of the two fingers then, right? But she's not. There is something for which I must apologize. I've acted the finger maiden, yet can offer no guidance. I am no maiden. My purpose was long ago lost. So in a way, we are still maidenless. Melina is just playing the role of one. All she asks in return is that we take her with us to the foot of the Erd Tree. She's searching for her purpose. Given to me by my mother inside the Erd Tree, long ago, for the reason that I yet live burned and bodiless. We can't yet say who her mother was, or why she was inside the Erd Tree, but I think we can guess how she's been burned, and I think it has to do with that marking around her closed eye. This symbol is a marking with three digits, and it looks quite similar to the Flame of Frenzy incantation, which reads, an incantation from the maddening three fingers causes the yellow flame of frenzy to burst forth from the caster's eyes. This incantation can drive human foes mad. Those whose eyes are afflicted with the flame of frenzy are racked with maddening pain and unstoppable tears. So it's possible that Melina has been burned by the flame of frenzy. Furthermore, this is an incantation of the Three Fingers, who are a much more ominous faction than the Two Fingers that we just mentioned earlier. So, on one hand, we have the Two Fingers, a group with healing incantations that enlist Tarnished for use by the Greater Will, and on the, well, the same hand, we have the Three Fingers, whose incantations can drive one mad with the Flame of Frenzy. The implication is obviously that these Finger factions were once part of a Greater Whole, but they split, and now are clearly reaching for different things. But Let's move on from Melina. You know, it's possible that I'm reaching by saying that she's a part of the Three Fingers, but I do want to talk about them some more. Their spell, the Flame of Frenzy, it causes the Madness status effect to build up. And when you get the Madness status effect, this happens. You see flame, and you clutch at your eyes. You also take a massive amount of damage. And it's just so similar to the frenzy mechanic from Bloodborne, right? Which was a status effect that drove you mad when you saw parts of the Eldritch Truth. Similarly, I think this madness effect in Elden Ring probably means that there's a terrible truth here that is simply excruciating to see. And do you know who else saw flame? The Prophets. The Prophet Blindfold reads, 
blindfold of exiled prophets who foresaw that their faith would end in flames, and were persecuted and driven from their homes as a result. After all, what use is eyesight to those who claim to know the true path? The fabric of their robes scrapes against their skin like a file, and the rickety cartwheel around the neck warns passers-by not to lend an ear to their meandering sermons. Those in power feared this prophecy so much that they exiled, they tortured, and they ridiculed the prophets who saw it. So if these prophets are related to the Three Fingers and the Flame of Frenzy, you know, they did see flame after all, well then it's no wonder then that those Three Fingers were cut off from the other two. Obviously we don't know why seeing flame is a terrible truth, but I'm guessing it has something to do with the guidance of grace, the greater will, and also the Erd Trees. So that brings us to the Erd Trees. The Erd Tree is that enormous golden tree in the distance, and according to the official website, the Elden Ring is the source of its power. Another way of thinking about that is actually that the Erd Tree might be a sort of parasitic plant feeding off the power of the Elden Ring, which is obviously pretty sinister when you think about it that way. Similar to the Age of Fire in Dark Souls, there was an entire age centered around this tree, called the Age of the Erd Tree. And from this golden Erd Tree, many gifts and graces were bestowed upon those in the lands between. One such gift were Tears of Life, considered blessings from the tree. From a gameplay point of view, these tears are really heavily linked to your healing flasks. The Crimson and Cerulean flasks tell us that they are modelled after a golden holy chalice that was once graced by a tear of life, and even the flask of wondrous physic is supposedly a relic of the physic chemists, priests of the Erd Tree. We can see many minor Erd Trees growing in the distance as well, and while we can't visit any in the network test, I'm guessing, based on previous games, that they probably give you tiers that let you get more healing flask charges or increase the strength of your healing. According to the Japanese item description, the two healing flasks are traditionally handed to the tarnished by their finger maiden when you first meet. And as we know, these are maidens of the two fingers, and since these flasks are blessed by the Erd Tree, these maidens of the two fingers probably serve the will of the Erd Tree as well. So those two things are linked now. And to serve the will of the Erd Tree is one thing, but it appears that there's another faction that worship a force even further up this divine chain. They're called fundamentalists. You know, they think they worship the core, the basic rules, and they worship the golden order or the golden law that the Elden Ring provided. And we know that this golden law is something that shattered along with the Elden Ring. We learn about these fundamentalists through an incantation called Litany of Proper Death. A litany is a sort of holy recital, and this is a holy incantation that devastates undead enemies. It gives them a proper death, and its description reads, An incantation used by Golden Order fundamentalists. Any felled by this incantation cannot be revived. You can use this in the network test against these skeleton enemies, for example, and they never get up again. Also, the Japanese description of a holy water pot goes on to read, The golden law does not permit the logic to live in death. And the Japanese word for logic is interesting, because it's the exact same word that Karth used in Dark Souls when he was talking about the logic of the world. You'll recall, in that game, Gwyn broke the logic of the world and created an endless age of fire, which came with a side order of undeath. And now, in Elden Ring, the logic of the world has been shattered in the exact same way. And guess what? It seems like a sort of undeath is occurring once again in this game as well, despite desperate attempts by Golden Order fundamentalists to restore the logic of the world and to purge these newly arisen dead. So let's just take a moment to recap the order of these divine concepts. The Elden Ring is a source of power, so powerful that it commanded the stars. It defined the logic of the world with its golden order, which is a type of law, and the Elden Ring is the source of the Erd Tree's power, which led to an age of the Erd Tree. During this age, Golden Grace filters down through the branches of the tree to the lands between, and it blesses some and spurns others, like the Tarnished, 
who were rejected. And then at some stage, the Elden Ring shattered. Along with it, its golden lore shattered. And the age of the Erd Tree seems to have ended because of this. Now, closer to the current events of the game, a force called the Greater Will is so desperate to hold on to its previous power that even the exiled tarnished have been brought back into the fold. You know, paradigms have shifted now, and now power is up for grabs. Before the ring was shattered, and probably during the Age of the Erd Tree, the lands between were ruled by Queen Marika, the Eternal. She's clearly a sort of immortal, and she even had demigod children. So far, we can be almost certain of two of her children. There's Godric, the demigod boss of Stormvale Castle, and Godwin, who was one of the first demigods to fall to the Rune of Death. We don't know much else about Marika, except that you can choose to resurrect at her statues sometimes, which does suggest to me that she has an affection, or maybe at least a use for the tarnished, uh, especially now that the ring has shattered. So how exactly did the ring shatter? Well, the Elden Ring is made up of runes, and in a recent story trailer, we learned that the Rune of Death was stolen. So this seemed to kick off the shattering process, leading to the deaths of the demigods, and then to a shattering war between them, as each of them tried to claim power. The official site even says, Even when fueled by the power of a great rune, no single side could find enough purchase to maintain a decisive victory. But somehow, it seems, we tarnished might be able to break this stalemate by becoming an Elden Lord. So, what exactly is an Elden Lord? Well, if I had to guess, it's probably like being a Lord of Cinder. Just like they unite powerful souls and burn for the flame, I would assume that we unite the fragments of the Elden Ring and embody it and unite it somehow. In Dark Souls, you could link the fire and keep the world order going but you could also usher in different endings that align with different sorts of beliefs. Just so, in Elden Ring, the power of the ring allows those in power to set or interpret the golden law or the logic of the world. According to Miyazaki, this golden order is something that the Elden Ring may have once represented, but not directly. It's more about how you apply those rules and how you enforce them on the physical world and what effects they have on it. So, what kind of ruler you'll be will matter a lot. Marika and her kin controlled the Elden Ring at one point and used its power to lead an age of the Erd Tree. According to Miyazaki, in the sort of heyday of the Golden Order of the Lands Between, there were two Elden Lords and Godfrey was the first of these. He was married to the Eternal Queen Marika and was representative of this period of grandeur and affluence. In the network test, we also learned about an order of knights who served Godfrey. This is the Crucible set, and this one belongs to one of 16 ancient knights who served Godfrey, the first Elden Lord. It reads, The vessels that cover this armor seethe with the power of life's crucible, that same power that coursed through the Erd Tree in its primordial form. So Godfrey's knights were imbued with the primordial power coursing through the Erd Tree, meaning that he was almost certainly a powerful man during that age of the Erd Tree. The Viridian Amber Medallion goes on to say, The Erd Tree's old sap becomes amber, treasured as the most precious of jewels in the age of Godfrey, the first Elden Lord. His power is so linked to the power of the Erd Tree, he might even be a part of it in some way. A recent tweet states, His memory still towers over the lands between. And you know what else towers over the lands between? The Erd Tree. Now, however, even Godfrey's age has passed, and he and his knights are not looked upon too kindly by history. A description reads, In time, the strength shown by these knights, and even their appearance, came to be looked upon with scorn, for having such close resemblance to chaos. I think obviously it's talking about the primordial power of the Erd Tree being a sort of power that is close to chaos and this isn't liked for some reason. It's so disliked, in fact, that I'm pretty sure this is a knight called Ordovus, who was one of the Crucible's most foremost knights, and he's seen imprisoned in an Everjail here. Everjails are sprinkled all over the map that we've seen so far. So for one of Godfrey's own knights to be imprisoned in these jails suggests hostility and punishment by whatever force ended Godfrey's reign. 
So even Godfrey, a man who surely accrued a ton of power during the age of the Erd Tree, even he couldn't hold on to his own age. So first there was the age of the Erd Tree, then the age of Godfrey, and now what? Well, now I think we're finally approaching the events of the game. Currently ruling over Stormvale Castle, the first legacy dungeon of Elden Ring, is Godric, one of Queen Marika's demigod children. Here, Godric's kingdom remains at war, long past the shattering, and he clings to a ruined legacy, a husk wrung dry by war. And there seems to be a bit of dispute about who the rightful king of Stormvale is. Recent tweet states, Godric's claim as the rightful golden king is not wholly uncontested. So I personally feel like Stormvale might have belonged to Godfrey. Uh, there's an enormous painting of him standing in the middle of a giant dining hall in Stormvale. And it's actually this same picture of Godfrey where he stands alongside his lion spirit stand thing. There are also lion banners alongside the painting, and the knights in this area have that same lion crest upon their armor. So I'm pretty sure the lion is a crest related to Godfrey. According to the Elden Ring Twitter, Godric was born a weakling child and coveted the strength of his kin. Just so, he literally grafts their arms onto his own. Even many statues of Marika, his own mother supposedly, have had their arms removed. So even now, there are those who plot to see Godric's crown pass into more worthy hands, and we might indirectly, or directly, bring about that plot. Because as we learned in the last trailer, the Snow Witch's tale is in need of the ending. Perhaps a Tarnished will be able to provide one. And if we fail, well, Tarnished seem to be on the menu for grafting onto Godric. Uh, there's even a force called Tarnished Hunters who seek to dismember us. So why does Godric value Tarnished Limbs so highly? Well, it's probably because we both have a common relative. Godfrey is logically Godric's father, and Godfrey is also our tarnished ancestor. And I come to this conclusion because in a very early interview, Miyazaki mentioned that our tarnished ancestor was banished and exiled. And now, in a recent Edge magazine interview, Miyazaki goes on to say that Godfrey himself became tarnished and he shares this deep connection with the player character. He too was exiled from the Lands Between and represents a lot of what the player character stands for. This casts such a revealing light on who the Tarnished are and why they were exiled. We were kind of like exiled through proxy thanks to Godfrey. It also explains why Godric values us but still resents our diluted bloodline. It explains why we resurrect at Statues of Marika. She was Godfrey's wife, and clearly we still have some of her favor. It might even explain this battle axe description, which reads, Axes are known to have been favored by the warrior king who led the long march. I marked this description as something that might be explained later, and I didn't expect to answer it so quickly, because the long march is capitalized, and maybe this represented our long walk into exile? Although that's just speculation. It's almost certain that Godfrey is this warrior king though. He favors axe weapons, and him being a warrior also goes on to explain this dialogue from Margit. Warrior blood must be run by the most tarnished. I'm so curious to learn why Godfrey was exiled. You know, what did he do to warrant all of this and all of this hatred of his bloodline, no less? Littering the lands between are these enormous chunks of architecture embedded far and wide across the entire known map. These aren't remains that are poking up from beneath the earth, nor are they remains of a structure that was on the earth. Instead, they're the ruin fragments of what was once a temple in the sky. Many of you will recognize this sky temple concept as being inspired by Hayao Miyazaki's Castle in the Sky, a famous film that featured this ancient yet advanced civilization that was lost, their castle floating over the earth, obscured behind clouds, eternally out of sight. At one point, a huge robot from that place falls to earth, and what do you know, one such giant exists in Elden Ring as well, or at least I think. It's surrounded by a group of giants just like it, and most importantly, it starts the fight at half health, which indicates to me that it might have just survived the fall. 
But what caused this fall? Well, if we look at some leaked concept art of Elden Ring's map, one can't help but notice the enormous crater at the center of the lands between. Now, this crater could have been caused by the falling Sky Temple, but a crater like this feels like it was caused by a meteorite. And meteorite, after all, is a sorcery in Elden Ring. It's quite a spectacular one, actually. Fragments of meteorite can also be found all over Limgrave, and some folks even call themselves star callers, scavenging desperately for these valuable shards. To some, meteorites held the same importance as stars, and stars and the cosmos, these are incredibly important concepts in Elden Ring's lore. In fact, stars and their vitality are the entire basis for entire branches of sorcery in this game. And that's a sorcery called Glintstone Sorcery. So what happens, from a lore point of view, when you cast a Glintstone Sorcery? Well, most sorceries scale with intelligence, and with your power of comprehension, you are tapping into the vitality of the cosmos, and channeling it. And to help channel its energy, you use a catalyst. In the network test, the only catalyst available was the Carrion Sorcerer Staff, which even has a blue glintstone embedded in its tip to aid with this process of getting into the flow of the cosmos. These glintstones are the amber of the stars, and they are also the symbol of the Carrion royal family. And I'll tell you now, if you decide to make a sorcerer build, Carrier is a name that you're going to read a lot. It's an old, magical place that was led by the Lunar Queen, and the history with glintstone and sorcery goes back a long, long way. And while this family was clearly incredibly proficient at glintstone sorcery, that doesn't mean they didn't have competition. Um, there was also an academy called the Raya Lucaria Academy, which was formed, and it had agents that were so proficient at sorcery that the Carrion royal family even saw fit to establish an order of Carrion knights to oppose them, but we'll talk about that later. For now, you just need to know that back then, the Carrion royal family was at its height, and remnants of their influence appear all over the lands between. The telescope item in this game, for example, is actually a part of a larger astrology tool that was used by members of the Carrion royal family. Larger telescopes are also a gameplay tool that you can actually go up to and use throughout the lands between to get a sense of your surroundings. So there really is evidence everywhere that the Carrion royal family was a force here at one point, because stargazing and looking up and learning from the cosmos was a huge thing. Uh, at this point, I also want to commend Sophie, who was speaking on Sinclair Law's channel when she discovered that these giant half-stone vessels also found in the network test are probably a type of astrolabe. And an astrolabe is an ancient astrological instrument. And the words stone astrolabe are actually a word that you can write in the online messaging system of Elden Ring. So the clues are everywhere, and more than just practicing glintstone sorcery, Carrier engaged in stargazing and research. But Sorceress Selen says it best. It should not be forgotten that glintstone sorcery is the study of the stars and the life therein. A fact lost on most sorcerers these days. However, the power of Carrier was doomed to fail. Almost every description of the Carrion royal family mentions their decline, but the telescope description says it best. During the age of the Erd Tree, Carrion astrology withered on the vine. The fate once writ in the night skies became fettered by the Golden Law. It was bound by the Elden Ring. Remember this line from the first trailer? That which commanded the stars. The Elden Ring commanded the stars. And it feels so good to finally understand that line. The Elden Ring's golden order shackled the fate once seen in the night sky, and the age of the Erd Tree that it gave rise to ended up indirectly or directly causing Carrion astrology to become obsolete. Glintstone and its research was superseded by a more powerful force. All of a sudden, the starry amber from the stars was replaced by golden amber. And obviously this was terrible for Caria, but for the rest of the world, perhaps it was a good thing. After all, according to that same narrator, the Elden Ring is responsible for giving life its fullest brilliance. 
And this should all remind you of Gwyn's Age of Fire in Dark Souls. It was something that was built on a lie, but it was still a beautiful age of warmth all the same. And the Elden Ring is the source of many blessings upon the lands between. One such force of power were the Erd Trees, which secrete golden amber, which is a type of sap that contains a sort of primordial life energy. This life energy is taken from the Elden Ring, and if the Elden Ring is commanding the stars, maybe the Elden Ring is getting its power from the stars, but that's just speculation. But whatever this golden amber is, it's powerful. So powerful, in fact, that it made Karius Glintstones of Starry Amber obsolete. Of course, it was only obsolete in the age of the Erd Tree, while the Elden Ring was commanding the stars. But of course, as you know, the Elden Ring has shattered, making this the perfect time for a resurgence. The Raya Lucarian Academy that we mentioned earlier, they leapt at the chance to regain relevance now that the ring was shattered, and they experienced a total renaissance of glintstone sorcery. A forefather of this renaissance was the wise Karalos, whose visage is represented in this mask of heavy stone, embedded with glintstone gems. It represents the total surrender of eyes and mind to glintstone study. Modern scholars wear the mask to show their lineage from Karalos, along with their deep blue Raya Lucarian robes, which they receive and take along with vows of virtue and austerity. However, it also says that with extended life, one is apt to forget old vows. Now it's unclear why their lives are extended, but clearly this long life has had an effect upon Raya Lucaria's culture. You have to remember, Elden Ring makes the shattering feel like it was a recent event, but it really was a long time ago. So long that its members are forgetting the vows that they took back when they were fledgling sorcerers. The first step on the journey of a new sorcerer is to learn Glintstone Pebble, which is a basic spell. We see it being cast here by the noble sorcerer summon. He's one of my favorites because he actually has a story. Um, apparently he studied sorcery at Raya Lucaria and after learning this spell, that was accomplishment enough for a noble. So it seems to imply that Raya Lucaria's sorcery was for sale. It was an export to the nobles of the Lands Between back in the day. And this helps to explain why this summon is so lovably useless. You know, he left the academy before he could be bothered to learn anything more important than their most basic spell. More successful sorcerers are encouraged to set off and travel from the academy on journeys of discovery. And the spell that they give to such wanderers is Glintstone Arc, which is this horizontal blade of magic that is designed to protect them against large groups of adversaries since it cleaves through them really effectively. It reads, fools often roam in packs. A line that betrays the arrogance that the Raya Lucarian way is superior and that those without intelligence should be looked down upon, which is also a common sorcery trope in the Soul series. Basically, every sorcerer you meet in these games refuses to teach you unless you have the required intelligence. For example, talk to sorceress Selen without the required intellect, and you'll get this unique dialogue instead. Ah, a yen for glimstone sorceries. I dare say your proclivities are far from ideal. Oh well, perhaps nurture will defy nature, with a bit of luck. But one must choose one's masters wisely. I was exiled from the Academy of Rea Lucaria, as a reviled, apostate witch. Do you still wish to learn from me? You only learn this if you talk to her without intellect, but Sorceress Selen was exiled from Rea Lucaria. Why? Well, maybe it was because she practiced magic other than Raya Lucarian glintstone sorcery. For example, here she teaches the gravitational sorcery, meteorite. She teaches the carrion sorcery, bubbles. And perhaps most damningly, she sells a blood sorcery, briars of sin. This is an aberrant sorcery, discovered along with red glintstone by those exiled to the north for their crimes summons large thorns from a whirl of blood shed by one's own hand in penance for sins. The Academy reviles this sorcery, which draws its power from faith. And, you know, usually in these games, when there's something that scales with intelligence and faith, it means 
there's a truth here that either clerics or sorcerers don't want to face, because both sides really hate each other, so why is there this overlap? Uh, the fact that this cosmic glintstone might be related to the blood of life probably makes the academy afraid for some reason. That's why they forbid this type of sorcery. Uh, but unfortunately, we know precious little about blood sorcery and red glintstone for now. So subscribe and make sure you learn about it later. So to conclude, the academy is kind of beset on all sides. They look down on the ignorant masses, they revile those who use faith, but that's not all because they've also somehow made enemies of fellow sorcerers. That's not common in these games. Um, earlier we talked about the Carrion royal family, and even back when they were the ones in power, they saw Raya Lucaria as a threat, so they formed an order called the Carrion Knights, who were originally established to counter the academy. These knights carry shields that reflect sorcery. They cast glint swords, blessed by pure moonlight. And their helmets are even ornamented by what looks like a queen chess piece, which is surely a reference to the Lunar Queen of this Carrion royal family. Of course, the Carrion royal family and their knights have fallen into disarray, but I'm pretty sure they would still be a force in the world. You know, you basically play as a carrier knight in the network test, using all of their equipment and spells. And by the way, the Moonlight Greatsword is going to be in this game. You just know it. They have an entire sect that is dedicated to the moon and the blessings from it. But yeah, all of these carrion item descriptions talk constantly about their decline. But I do have a bit of theory about that. What if their decline was literal? What if carrier, or some of them at least, ended up underground. Let me explain that theory. So every time you cast a spell in these games, a symbol will briefly flash that shows the type of spell you're using. This is the symbol for blood sorcery, this is one for glintstone sorcery, and this spell, magic bubble, uses the symbol for carrion sorcery. And the description of bubble reads, a lost ancient sorcery used by wretches who dwell in underground ruins. So it's interesting that these wretches deep below the ground are using a spell that has a carrion symbol. Of course, it's still just a theory that the carrion royal family ended up deep underground. I'll have to thank Loki for that one. But it's a good segue into our next fascinating topic, which is the Eternal City, a place lost in ruin underground, and a place that is mentioned in all item descriptions in the game so far that have to do with gravity. So Meteorite, for example, is still glintstone sorcery, but it's one that draws upon gravitational force, which is obviously still a very cosmic force. Uh, this sort of gravitational sorcery was used by a great white king, or kings, in their eternal city, where meteorites held the same import as stars. And that's the end of the video. I'm sorry for the abrupt ending, uh, that narration was recorded a really long time ago, and I kind of go on a rant about the Eternal City, which might end up being proven wrong in a few days, so maybe it's best to avoid that and just see where we end up. Thank you so much for watching, I know this was a long video, and I hope it inspires you to check out some item descriptions and read about the lore and really engage with that part of Elden Ring as well. And I'll see you at launch on Twitch and on YouTube. But until then, take care.